The film is Boxcar Bertha. And the way it came about is that my husband had made a film called Bloody Mama with Shelley Winters and Bobby De Niro. And, um, and he made it for AIP. And they wanted another woman gangster. And I love to do research. I just love to do research. So Roger said he was looking for a woman gangster. <clears throat> and I tried finding information about women gangsters. And other than the, you know, the most notorious like Bonnie and Clyde, Ma Barker, I really couldn't find much. And I called a friend of mine who worked um, in the DA's office and I said, got any interesting things on women gangsters? Why can't I find anything? And um, I was uh, just astonished that I just couldn't find more. I thought I'd just go to the library and got a lesson. And he said, well, until very recently, there was a stigma against putting anything in the news about women or children and crime because of the way women were thought of, and, which is you know not so good. But in this case, it worked to their advantage, I guess. Um, they, they wouldn't really get in the news unless the, the crime was so notorious that it couldn't be overlooked. So I said, thank you very much. I went back to the library and I found a book called uh, The True Story of Boxcar Bertha as Told to Dr. Ben L. Reitman. And it was a story about a woman who was a hobo in the 30s. And she, um, you know, had some intellectual and artistic background, some bit. But basically, she was just a hobo and went from one place to the other by jumping on a boxcar when she felt like it. She had a lover who was an IWW worker. Uh, she actually end up, ended up doing social work in Chicago uh, before somehow she made her way to San Francisco. And when I tracked her down, that's where she was living as a complete recluse. And um, I thought that the section of her story about not being restricted by any of the kind of things that we had just come out of, like white gloves and hats and so on, um, was a very interesting story to tell. That it was better, I thought, to come at the idea of women's liberation and their, their position and why they were not treated equally with men, to come at it in this kind of askew way. So that's what I found very interesting about the project. Um, so the writer came in, Bill Corrington, he was quite a character, a Southern fellow, um, philosopher, and he uh, started working on the project and then brought his wife in to write with him, Joyce Corrington. And we ended up in a story conference in which Bill said, you know, we should really change the title of this to Big Bill Shelley so that I can base it more on my grandfather, who was an IWW worker. Well, showing my great maturity and how I really in charge of everything I was, I burst into tears and left the room. So Roger came out and said, what is the matter? And I said, he wants to ruin it. He wants to make it the story of Big Bill Shelley instead of Boxcar Bertha. And Roger said, well, that's not going to happen. And I said, well, why not? He's the writer. And he said, because AIP wants a woman gangster movie. So if you start with distribution, you have certain pieces you need to fill in. So I was much relieved by that. And then um, Marty Scorsese came in. And this is where I got a real um, eye-opening experience. Probably the most eye-opening experience of my life as, as a filmmaker. Uh, and Marty had some idea about the project also that had to do with his relationship with his brother, I believe. And once again, I thought, oh no, this is gonna go all wrong. My project, my story about this woman who lived outside the system. And then David Carradine and Barbara Hershey came in. And um, Roger thought that Barbara Hershey was a little overweight and he told her agent that she should drop a few pounds before we started shooting, not knowing that she was pregnant with David's child. So Barbara and David now brought their own dynamic to the project and I could see right before my eyes that I had really lost control. I didn't know how much I'd lost control until we got to Camden, Arkansas where the picture was to be shot. Marty had been there for a few weeks before in pre-production and preparing 
and we walked into his motel room in Camden, Arkansas. Walls was the entire film sketched. Every single shot of the picture is sketched by Marty. And there it was. And we ended up with a Marty Scorsese film, Boxcar Bertha. So. And how was that character perceived by the audience? Oh, by the audience. Well, I'm not sure about the audience, but for me, Marty did so much more with my idea than I ever could have done that I was just astonished and thrilled. And I mean, to this day, I'm really in awe of Marty's abilities as, as a filmmaker. And he is the total filmmaker. And while I'm not a huge fan of the possessory credit, I think in Marty's case, <laughs> there's no other way. You know, he's seen more films than anybody. So he comes at it from film history. He has memorized sh so many shots of sh so many scenes and how they go together. And then he uses them and he, you know, reuses them in, in con interconnected ways that you don't even, you're not even aware of as you're looking at the film. And then if it gets dissected for you by, by Marty or by, you know, a film critic who's very aware of all of this, you're just kind of astonished again. Um, and of course, as an editor, even though he had an editor, he worked with, you know, over time, Thelma Schumacher, who was just, you know, kind of amazing. It was still Marty who shot the picture. It was still Marty saying, you know, this is what I want to do. And so I always thought that he was the real force behind the editing of any of his pictures. And it didn't stop there. I mean, anything that affected his picture, he was not happy to turn it over to somebody else. The music, Boscar Bertha, what was the music from the get-go? He was listening to Delta Blues and he was, yeah. Did you ever keep in contact with the real life Bertha? She no, she was very reclusive. She never would speak to me. We we tracked her down and we got her to sign um, a release and paid some money uh, to her. The public, the Ben L. Reitman was dead. The publisher had gone out of business. There was just tracking this woman down was extremely difficult. And I actually did it through. There's a kind of hobo conventions. They're kind of, you know, a little sub rosa. Uh, and read somebody there who said, "Yeah, I know where she's where she is." And so. And do you know why she was so reclusive? Because it sounds like her life had been about total freedom. And why would she I know. be the opposite way? I don't know. I was never able to find out. 